Hi, this is Brett Sankis, the Right Brain Business Attorney, and this is another video in our series about mastering business partnerships. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to look at an actual business partnership dispute, a uh, strained business partnership. This is from a real uh, situation that I was presented with a possible client. We're going to do it in case study format, so what the business schools call a case study. So we're going to take a look at what's going on, we're going to analyze what the parties have done right, and what they've done wrong, and uh, think through kind of what they should do from here. So maybe about a year ago, a gentleman called me, his name was John. He was in a 50-50 partnership with a gentleman named Gary. They were longtime friends, best friends from youth. They had no business partnership documentation whatsoever aside from the certificate of formation that was filed with the state uh, and then the yearly annual reports. They're sort of both on things you follow with the Texas Comptroller if you're in Texas. But they didn't have an operating agreement, a company agreement, a uh, stockholder agreement, founder agreement, you know, whatever you want to call that, kind of heavy lifting document between the partners. More background just to set things up. They, so John did sales, Gary did the operations. It was just the two of them. They'd been going at it for over 10 years. They drew relatively equal salaries, although they both paid themselves the same amount through payroll but John was taking a little bit more money out of the company. And, you know, with Gary's understanding, not anything sort of expressed, nothing in writing, just kind of acknowledgement that John needed a little bit more money out. They had not talked, um, I mean, they talked sort of in passing and about, you know, regular business sort of stuff. Did you do X? Did you do Y? What's going on? But they hadn't had a meaningful conversation about the business, hadn't had a meaningful conversation about their partnership in close to a year. So that's the background, that's the setup of what we have going on here. Let's talk about what the parties have done right. Many, many lawyers will tell you never be in a 50-50 business partnership. I give much more nuanced uh, advice and insight around this issue. I think they can work tremendously well, and I think that 51-49 or you know, 90-10 or unequal partnerships have their own risks. They're just not the same risk that attorneys are worried about of stalemate. That's really why a lot of attorneys will tell you never be in a 50-50. You're just going to get deadlocked. Well, you may, but that doesn't mean they can't work well. So the parties here know each other very, very well. They've known each other for over 20 years. That's great. If you're going to be in a 50-50 partnership, that's critical. Don't go into a 50-50 partnership with someone you met at a tech meetup last week. That's not a good idea because you just don't know if you're in a position to be able to work things out. 50-50 partnerships require a lot of communication and they require a lot of give and take on both sides and they require you be just connected and there's got to be a lot of trust and you just really have to know that whenever there's a disagreement, because it'll come up all the time, right? Should we advertise in that place? Should we advertise in this place? Should we say, you know, these things come up all the time. So you've got to know you can work those things through. You've got to know your partner will work those things through with you. Yeah, I'll take this one, you take that one. Or I see your point, it's no big deal. If you get into business in a 50-50 partnership and every single thing, and I've, I've, I've seen these people, every single thing, they disagree with unless it's their decision. Like it, it just, that's impossible, right? So you've got to have a lot of history. It doesn't necessarily have to be business history, although that would be good rather than just friendship, but you need a lot of history to even attempt a 50-50 partnership, to have any expectation of success. I think it's a good thing that he's in business with a friend. Now, other people might take a different position, right? Don't mix business and pleasure, I hear that a lot. To me, that's for someone who wants to wear two faces in the world. They want to be two different people. Like, what is the problem, right? Like, to me, yes, you're, you're, you're potentially taking a risk going into business with a friend, but I think you ought to be able to be relationship-oriented. You ought to be able to preserve the relationship wherever the business goes, and these things can work really, really well in tandem. I think they can work great. You know, I want to be in business and do business personally with people I like, people I want to socialize with. That makes being in business, I mean, it just makes it much more exciting. It's more interesting. I don't believe in not being in business with family. I believe when you do these things, you're taking on a heightened level of responsibility around the relationship. It's incumbent on you to be sure that you, you value and respect the relationship, that you don't fall back on, well, it's business, sorry you know, and screw the other person over. Like, no, there's a whole different level of operating in this arena. A level that should be applied to any partnership, but it's sort of intensified if you're in business with family or long-time friends. But I think it's a good thing. So that's what they did well. On the not so good side, there's zero documentation. And you can argue with someone you've known for 20 years, you don't need a partnership agreement, you're never gonna sue each other. 
Um, we'll see as we go on in this case study that that's not always the case. And it's hard to know always, even if you know the person for 20 years or so, you just really don't know what could happen here. So I think having a document, having something to enforce one day is helpful. But if you've listened to my video about the real reason to have a partnership agreement, it has nothing to do with having something to enforce because that's already in lose-lose, things that have devolved and are terrible territory. You have a partnership agreement, even if you're in business with a longtime friend, someone you've had a successful exit with, your dad, you have that to set out expectations and clearly represent what you're each thinking about things. Because even with someone who you'll always work it out, you never sue each other, again, don't think that lightly because it happens all the time. Families end up broken up over things. But even if that were really true, you're still going to forget things, misremember, you know, there's still all that stuff. So having a record of like, hey, here's what we talked about, is just helpful for the relationship. And then two, sorry, three, I guess, but these are, these are, that was the number one most important reason is to be sure that you have a really good, uh, clear understanding of what the other party's expectations and intentions are, like how things ought to work to avoid misremembering and disagreements over that sort of stuff. Two is to talk everything through. So the uh, discipline of putting a partnership agreement on paper uh, in that process, you do that through a corporate lawyer like myself, we'll walk through all sorts of questions and scenarios and situations. So you, you're, you're sure you've talked it all through and then you want to get it on paper if you got to that point. Then the third reason is to, is to have something to enforce. Um, so they didn't have any documentation. They were uh, really siloed in the division of labor. So John's doing sales and Gary's doing operations. You've probably heard me talk about a merger of equals where you've got two CEOs and people are running things together and it's just like, that's not a great situation where people are kind of stepping on each other's toes and if there are employees, they don't know who to report to and, and who's sort of really in charge on certain issues. So that's not great. But in a partnership with only two people, no other employees, you handle all that, you know, in your corner, and I'll handle all that in my corner, like in silos, like sort of in, in vacuum separately, that really has a risk of being problematic. Number one, you don't know what the other's doing. I think over time, there's a natural inclination. We're human and we sort of spin the narrative to support our, you know, sort of set of like what helps us sometimes. So it's really easy to think to yourself, what's he doing? Like, I don't think he's doing anything over there, you know. It, 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 I mean, I, mean, I do so much more. Mine, the operations is so much more important. Like, anyone could call someone and say, you want to buy something? You know, but like, delivering this, right? So, and on the other hand, you're hearing someone say, like, anyone can fulfill that order, right? Like, how do you, how do you get someone to pay, right? So, again, you're going to be, hopefully, with a partner who's got complementary skill set. Someone can be responsible for one thing, but I think you want to have a better understanding of what the other's doing and working together in some fashion, rather than just passing in the night, you do X and I do Y, it does have a real tremendous potential for a problem in that. Okay, three, they were taking unequal salaries. So uh, they're paying themselves the same amount through payroll. They are both full-time in the business. They've both been working in it for 10 years and John's drawing a little bit more out of the bank account. And my understanding is he's drawing it with, with you know, he's mentioned it to Gary, but hasn't really made it formal hasn't been explicit, hasn't said, I don't believe, are you okay with this, Gary? John has a reason for that. You know, John's got a bigger family and more obligations. That makes sense, but you still have to be very, very respectful of your partner who, yeah, but they didn't take on those obligations. Those were your choices, right? You live in the house you live in because you wanted to. You have three kids you wanted to. Those are things you decided to do. Yes, objectively, you've got more obligation and maybe you've got a partner of things are great who says, I understand that. I'm good with it, you know? But you've got to be very respectful and ask explicitly, not sort of in passing, hey, you know, I'm going to take a little more this month. Or, um, yeah, you know I'm doing that, right? No, like, is this okay with you, right? Gary's doing the same amount of work. When, I mean, I think so, but like, I'm, I'm pay I'm, ostensibly they are. They're doing, they're both full-time in the business. It would be natural for Gary to be thinking, well, what do you mean? Like, we should make the exact same amount of money. So if there's going to be a dis uh, some sort of disparity in income, it, it's okay, but be sure your partner is really on board with it. And that became an issue in this case, as we'll explain, but it's commonly an issue. And, and I've been on both sides of the table on this issue, by the way. Um, and both sides have points. Look, I've got more obligations. It's not going to my pocket. I'm not having fun. Every weekend, you and have kids, you're flying around having a great time. Yeah, 
But, you know, those were your choices. Those were his choices. And in the end, you know, it's, it's kind of Gary's position on this issue is going to be the stronger one. But uh, it, it, you can work it out. But it's one where, really, if you're in John shoes and want to take more money, you've got to be very clear and get really clear permission for it. Maybe even give something in return. Not just like, hey, I, I thought he was okay with it. You're going to walk into a problem. The fourth issue, and this is probably the biggest issue, is they haven't had a conversation, a meaningful conversation about the business, the partnership in a year. I mean, that's absolutely nuts. Like, you've got to make anything work, any partnership work, any even employee-employer relationship, boss to board. I mean, all this stuff like requires communication, but particularly a 50-50 business partnership. Are you kidding me? Like you've got to be regularly figuring out some making time to have conversations about the business. You actually should be making time to have conversations about their lives and the relationship aside from the business. You've heard me talk about syncing up, getting a beer outside of the office, whatever it is. Like this is really important stuff that you nurture these relationships or they're never... It's never going to work. It's just really important to understand that a 50-50 partnership can be amazing, but it takes a lot of time. So at this point, John contacts me. He's very, you know, he's kind of like, this has been going on forever. Gary's not working very hard. Like, I'm just tired of this. I want to get out of this partnership. I've got to fix things. What do I do? How do I, how do I sort through this? So he, he's got a problem. He's knee deep in it. He hasn't headed it off. At the um, outs, uh, at the outset, you know, a year ago, we're we're pretty far along. So you really have three choices. Almost always, you have three choices. But John had three choices. One is just walk away from this thing. Okay, that's one. Two is sit down and have the the difficult conversation. I think it's Tim Ferriss who says we're measured. The success of a person's life will be measured by the number of difficult conversations that they're willing to have. And this one isn't an email, by the way. This is a sit down in a face to face. Let's talk about what's going on here. And, and that one is done in the spirit of trying to fix things, by the way. The third is to decide it's already gone south, but I'm not willing to walk away and to bring someone like me or a mediator or someone into the picture and to make things more formal and more sort of step things up and head down the dispute track. So in a scenario where there isn't a brewing dispute, the other partner hasn't lawyered up, uh, bringing me in or suggesting you go to a mediator is to me sort of the third option. It's the least favorable because the partner, if you haven't had any conversations about this stuff, yeah, your partner might be thinking things aren't great. They're probably thinking this isn't great and I got to get rid of, you know, you, you know, they're probably thinking about getting rid of you, but, but to bring an attorney or something in that picture is to signal, I'm not even willing to work this out. I'm not willing to pay respect to the relationship. I don't think you'll work it out with me. I'm going to take it to that step. And it isn't always, sometimes this is something that my client wants to do because, not because they really feel like they're not willing to pay the relationship respect, but they don't think it'll work or they're scared of their partner at this point sometimes. Like they really think like, I don't think I'm going to get anywhere unless I have some help. Okay, I get all that stuff. And, and so sometimes there's a reason, like, and that's the third and least attractive option in my book, generally, is really the only one that we're going to pursue. So you can do that. Uh, mediation, where you go to a third party to kind of figure things out, that is something, it's like sort of couples. I'm married, you know, if my wife and I, I mean, things are great. But if they weren't, you know, maybe at some point you say, let's go see a counselor. The idea is that we're leaving this whole thing. It doesn't have to be the idea that, like, we're going to fight, but maybe just we have to work it out. So this third, third option can be in that vein. But I still feel like you run a huge risk that your partner thinks, why don't you sit down and talk to me about this, right? Like you're walking right into that natural response and that's not going to frame the path towards a resolution very well. So I think that that's the third and least attractive option. It may be one that you need in the future, but one and two, um, either walk away or sit down and have a, a real hard heart. Walking away, John wasn't willing to do that. So, and it can be a little bit complicated when you have nothing down on paper, like how you do that. You've got uh, depending on the entity form, they were in a, a, a Texas limited liability company, so Texas LLC. By default, in a member-managed Texas LLC, the members are going to have duties, fiduciary-type duties usually to each other, which mean you can't just haul off and go start another business on the, on the side while you prepare to just take off on your partner. Like, that's problematic. You're in a partnership and you owe that person more transparency not to compete with the partnership. So, you know, if you had all the money in the world, they could just say, hey, I'm out of here and I want to go figure out something else to do in life and take a year off. Hey, that's that's good. But he needs to work to feed his family. I mean, I think both these partners did. So he would want to take time to plan his next step. But that's a little bit problematic. Not always impossible, but has carries some risk. So... 
I uh, didn't want to leave the business. Taking some of the clients was important to him, but you know, as I advise, you're not, you can't be having those conversations now. I mean, it really, there's a lot of risk to doing that, to try and line up these clients to, to take from the business. So, so that left us with sitting down to have a heart to heart. So that's the option that we chose. That's the option that John implemented. So that's the background. That's what the parties did well and what they didn't do well. And that's John's decision going forward. So we'll cut it right there and I will see you in part two.